it gets frustrating because I, I feel like what happens is for all the good intention that you have as a parent, it could literally work in reverse. Like you could literally be like teaching your child to be dependent, mm-hmm. not self-reliant. Mm-hmm. And- Welcome to Confessions of a Financial Advisor, the antidote to conventional financial wisdom. My name is Al, and I've been a financial advisor for over 20 years. This podcast will explore the emotional and psychological factors that affect our behaviors. All of the other financial podcasts out there will talk about the numbers and the math. We will confront the stories that we all fuse with that ultimately set the course for our lives. I am not looking for new clients and have no intention on running for any kind of office. I'm going to tell you like it is and call out all the commonplace BS. Now, let's get into confessions of a financial advisor. Okay, Virginia, we're live for parental guilt. Yeah, I like parental guilt. It had the name mommy guilt, but then, you know, I'm a dad, so. Yeah, dads feel it too. Yeah, especially now with this quarantine. Now we're all home together. And so parental guilt, it's something that's so common. Oh, yeah. We got talking about it. You feel it. You're in Texas. I feel it. I'm in North Carolina. And you just hear about it. It's like you hear about it on social media. Now you're trapped at home with your kids. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds terrible. Trapped at home with your kids. I know. Trapped. They're 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 trapped with (laughs) us, too. Get to be home with our kids. Get to be home. (laughs) (laughs) They're trapped with us, too. So it goes both ways. (laughs) And you have this weird feeling if you work from home. Mm -hmm. And you spend a few hours on your computer or you're on the phone or you're doing work. Like after that time goes by, you start thinking about your kids up in their rooms. And you're like, oh, man, I haven't checked in on them. You know, they're in their rooms all day. I got to like go up there. I got to go do something. And Mm -hmm. so even if you go up for 15 minutes, you check in on them, you make them something to eat. Then you go back down, you have to work again. And it's just like this constant pull of like feeling this guilt of like not parenting well. I'm not doing it well enough. I'm neglecting them. Yeah. What are they doing? Are they watching screens the whole time? Yeah. Do they need me? And they're not coming in my office to tell me like, is there something going on that I don't know about? There's so many thoughts that just run in the background. And then there's the whole presence piece. You want to be a present parent. Cause I think some of us didn't get that as much when we were kids. So we're trying to correct that. But then there's the balance of needing to work, yes, needing them to be busy and needing uninterrupted time. Yes. And it's hard. Yeah. I think the pendulum swung like from one side to the other, from our parents' generation to like now us. Our parents just let us go. Like I remember like waking up in the morning, I'd have a bowl of cereal if it was on the weekend. And after a little while, my mom would be like, all right, go outside. Mm -hmm. Put on your shoes. Like, okay. Went outside, started running around the neighborhood, rode our bikes everywhere. They weren't concerned about vans and pedophiles and (laughs) kidnappers and God knows what, like violent crimes. And there was more crime back then than there is today. Mm. But we're more, we're so much more worried today about our kids Yes. And so the concern is, I feel like they're way too coddled and they're not building the strength to be street smart, to be independent. Right. That really worries me because like, it's coming from a good place. All parents want to protect their kids. Mm -hmm. But I think we've blown it so far out of proportion. And like, we've totally overestimated the probabilities of like all the bad things that can happen. Well, and I think it's, Social media, there's so many factors, right? Yeah. The the social media is a big piece of it because we see all our friends post. Most of us are quote unquote friends with people that we don't actually know. So we see their posts too. We see what their kids are doing. Yep. All of the information. And like some of your other prior podcast episodes, it's hard to gauge what's real, what's not real. You know, is it a highlight reel that we're seeing or is this a real event that happened where someone's you know kid was almost taken or something and yeah. so we see that stuff all the time and it's like you said we're trying to do the best we can mm-hmm. without hovering without 
putting them at risk. Like there's a balance between all of this. Yeah. So even myself, I'm working from home. And even if I send them outside, I cannot help myself to get up right. and go look out the window periodically and just be like, are they still out there? <laughs> yeah. So you're mentally toggling all day, right? You're going from a project back to them, back to the project, back to them. That It's like you're, it's draining, mm-hmm. right? You get exhausted after a full day of doing that. Yeah. And I think the mommy guilt thing comes in too, because even when my husband's home, He's totally got the kids and this is just ridiculous that I feel this way anyways, but I hear them playing or whatever. And, you know, I can hear if he's raising his voice a little, there might be a discipline thing going on and I'll like stop working and just kind of listen and lean back in my chair. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. really, do I not trust that he can handle this? (laughs) Like, that's not what's going on, but it is that mommy guilt of like, well, maybe if I was in the room, such and such wouldn't have happened. Like I just constantly feel that pull that I should be there. Mm. But then I want to clarify that and and say like, I do try not to be that helicopter parent. Yeah, You've mentioned the book, The Coddling of the American Mind. I think that's really real. Yeah. We are definitely all having this padded, easy life these days and we're perpetuating it and we're not meaning to. Yes. We're doing the best we can. Yeah, we are. It's just, it's kind of like that idea of stand guard at the door of your mind. Whatever's coming in, if you're seeing three different things about kids being abducted, or you're seeing three different things about Mm -hmm. child trafficking, and you're going to automatically think that it's more prevalent than it really is. Yeah. So one of the cool things that came out of that book, The Coddling of the American Mind, well, at least what I got from it, Mm. they had this, it was a questionnaire that they used to give out to parents of children that were six years old that were going into first grade. Hmm. And they did it back in 1973. No, I'm sorry. It was 1979 because that's when I would have been six. Oh, cool. Right. So that's why it kind of really clicked for me. Cool. It's like six questions, maybe, if I'm getting this correct. If you answer these questions, if your children can do this, then they're prepared to go into the first grade. Hmm. So one of them was like, you know, they have to have like four molar, big teeth, whatever. One of them was that they have to stand on one foot. A couple of silly things, but the one that stood out was, can your child walk six to eight blocks to a store, a family member's house, or a friend's house on his own without anybody else? Like send your six-year-old outside... Six year old, eight yeah. blocks to someone's house. Eight blocks. Imagine eight blocks. I, like not one block. Even one block would be freaky, right? For yes. Six, I mean, not back then. If I can't see my kid, I'm like calling the other mom. Is he there yet? But this is what I mean. It was normal back then. And so what parents today say is like, oh, but you don't understand. Like it's more violent today. And like there's more crime mm-hmm. today. And there's more pedophiles out there. There's more kidnappers. I'm like, no, there's not. Back in the 70s, it was worse than it is today. I think we're just more paranoid. Absolutely more paranoid. And and rightfully so, because like we have all of the social media, we have all of this negative news, negative information kind of coming into us. And then you're also witnessing Mm -hmm. how everybody else is parenting and everybody else is doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then there's also like this little bit of weird comparison parenting shaming. Yes. And I was telling you, we just went to the beach with the kids and we left the kids. We left the kids under the umbrella at the beach because they didn't want to go swimming and they were being crabby. It was like the fourth day of the trip. And we're like, that's it. We're going for a walk. You guys are fine. The the cooler's there. You have water. You have sunscreen. Yeah. We're going for a walk down the beach. And your kids are older. They're a little bit older. So there's a 12-year-old. We had two 12-year-olds and a 10-year-old. Okay. One was a friend. Yeah. They can chill. They'll be fine. Totally fine. It's not like you left a five-year-old. No, no, no. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's good. Back in the 70s, you'd probably leave a five-year-old and be just fine. They probably (laughs) would have. So yeah, we left for an hour, came back, just fine. Perfect. And also the the other thing I picked up on at the beach was like, sometimes I would see literally like a one and a half-year-old or two-year-olds, like freaking just stumbling around the beach, like almost out on their feet because like they're it's, trying to walk yeah. around, like walking toward the ocean. And I don't see a parent in sight. And you're looking around. And then I lo- I'm looking around and like, where's the parents? And then, you know, like if the kid gets too close to the ocean, somebody comes out of the woodwork and awesome. like, like the kid was fine. And to me, I'm like, I have it in me. I'm like being that helicopter parent. I'm it's like so judging hard. other people. Why aren't you right? You have to be within 10 feet of your toddler. <laughs> 
oh, if you're, if you're 15 feet away, that's too far, you know, like. Right. But it's frowned upon to put that little like backpack leash thing on them. Like, uh, <laughs> so. A freaking <laughs> leash. Do you ever remember that as a kid? No. No, no. no. It's like little, like these days. <laughs> these days. Yeah, so it's leash. like you got the parents that do that, that they're like, oh no, I can't let him go. He'll, he'll run. And then there's right. the parents that are like, you have your kid on a leash. What's wrong with you? Like that's inhumane. <laughs> I think I think I lean on the second. Yeah. How do you put your kid on a leash? It it just looks so ridiculous. It really does. Like it's just but that's they're not a completely dog. Completely perfectly illustrates that pendulum swing, like you said. Yeah. Let your kid run 150 feet toward the ocean before you call out to them, like, hey back a little bit versus you have your kid right. wearing like a monkey backpack with a leash attached to it. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just, yeah. there are so many different parenting styles. They say, oh, there's no book on this. There's no perfect right way to do this. There are parenting books, but there again, every single one of those books is written by yeah. A person who had an opinion about it. And maybe they're from Harvard yeah. or educated in some certain way, but there's no true perfect way to parent. And then there's all of us trying. Maybe we're winging it. Maybe we've read some books, maybe not. Like, but we're all trying. And there's all these different perspectives colliding. Mm -hmm. That's where some of the guilt comes from. From yeah someone else saying, oh, I would never do that. Or, oh, like, look at what they're doing with their kid. It's so ridiculous. Yeah. It's also a part of like that fear mongering. So like I heard a news story of some lady got arrested because she had her 10 year old in the car hmm. and the kid didn't want to go into the store. So she's like left the car running and she hmm. went into the store and I guess she was in there for like a half an hour and police came oh, and, man. and the kid was like, no, I'm fine. Didn't matter. They arrested the parent anyway. They said they're neglecting the child. That's insane. I'm like, this is completely getting out of control. Like people are losing their minds like with this stuff. Wow. Yeah. So I fully agree with don't leave a young child in the car because don't they leave don't... a four-year-old or a no. five-year-old in the car. If you're 10 years old, you're okay. Right. You know how to roll down the windows. You know how to lock and unlock and get out. Right. Little kids. Yeah. Don't ever do that. But Especially when the kid's like, no, I don't want to go. I'm going to sit here and play on my phone. Yeah. Yeah, I can't believe we that. We always gauged it by their comfort level. If the kid doesn't want to, no, don't leave me, mom. Okay, we're not going to leave you if you don't right. want to. But once they were at the point where like, you're f we're fine, you know, we'll just be on our phone. And yeah, like, okay, it's fine. We're just going into the freaking grocery store. It's not a big deal. Right. Like everybody's crazy. Everybody thinks there's like just kidnappers and pedophiles lurking around the corner just waiting for you to like leave your car to grab your kid. Yes. I'm like, oh, please yes. stop this madness. I do feel that a little bit though because I am a small petite lady. Yes. And so I've always been, and thankfully my dad instilled kind of an idea in me from a young age like, hey, watch your back. Mm -hmm. Like you have to watch your own back. So right. I feel that. I've always been aware of that. So I am aware. <laughs> yeah. But... Yeah. I mean, I don't think there's people lurking around every corner, especially trying to get my kids or something. Right. But there is that, like I mentioned earlier, like a little bit of paranoia naturally that comes from all of the media that we're exposed to all the time. Well, it's that idea of life is risk. I mean, everything about mm -hmm. life is there's some form of risk, right? It's all about like quantifying the risk or measuring how mm -hmm. much risk there is. And so what do you do? Do you bubble wrap the world to suit your kid? You know, like, or do you bubble wrap your kid? Mm -hmm. It's like you want to prepare your child for the world. Not You can't prepare the world for your child. Right. You tell the child, listen, somebody tells you to come with them. You don't go. Yeah. And like simple things like, yeah, yeah don't ever like get into a car with somebody right you know all those basics that I think we were told when we were little yeah I think the big fear now is when to introduce some of those concepts like at which age mm -hmm. because you know like mine are little yeah and so I don't want to scare them right but I do want them to know not to do those things right so it's like that balance of like how much do you tell them 
when do you introduce these concepts about like body safety and I, <laughs> yeah and your children are young so like my kids feel i feel they have the common sense to know what yeah. and what not to do they're not going to just jump into somebody's car yeah. they're not going to come over to some stranger and they know that it's like we and we kind of joke about it like we make jokes you know i'll pull up I'll be like, hey, little girl, you got, I got some candy here. And they're like, uh-huh, funny, dad. Yeah. You know, I'm like, yeah, obviously you don't do that, okay? <laughs> so it gets frustrating because I, I feel like what happens is for all the good intention that you have as a parent, it could literally work in reverse. Like you could literally be like teaching your child to be dependent, mm-hmm. not self-reliant mm-hmm. and not... Uh, and that that makes me like more worried than anything. Right. Like I would rather them have some risk, have more risk. Right. Like go by yourself, go do the six or eight blocks and walk. Mm-hmm. I'd rather have the risk of getting, obviously I don't want them mm-hmm. to get hit by a car. I don't want them to get snagged by anybody. Yeah. But I would rather like put some risk out there than have them just be so coddled that they're just not self-reliant and not independent. That's that's the bigger worry for me as a dad. But I think I know as a mom, it's probably a different dynamic. Like you're more worried right. about, I don't want my baby to be hurt. I don't want them to be hurt either. But I think I come from it from a standpoint of I need them to be strong. Right. They're not living at home when they're 21, you know, like <laughs> no way. Like 18, you're out. <laughs> right. It's not just that. I mean, it's no, but I think it is refreshing for people to hear you know, it's not just mom guilt. Like that's a really common social media, you know, it's probably even a hashtag, Mm -hmm. but dads have guilt too. And I think that's really refreshing for people to hear and that it's parenting guilt. Like no matter who you are, which parent or gender you are, you have guilt around how much you're present with your kid, what you're telling them, what you're not telling them, when to tell them, where you are, how much freedom you give them, like everything. Yeah. The generalization is that, you know, men are usually the ones that are outside working. Not so much now, but like, because the mothers are home with the children. So there's more of that guilt where the, Mm -hmm. you know, usually the father's out working and like just not even concerned with the children, right? Yeah. That goes back to that like traditional family structure where the mom stayed home with the kids. Yep. Mom didn't work. Yep. Dad earned the money. Daddy came home at five o'clock. Mom had dinner on the table, you know, just that traditional structure. And I don't know of many families that still follow that to the T. Like at least the mom works from home or maybe she does MLM or she does something to contribute to the family financial situation there's a lot of where it's completely reversed, where the mom works and it's a stay-at-home dad. That's very true. Yeah. I mean, I think that's really refreshing. And I think so too. You can't tell me that that dad doesn't have dad guilt because he's the one with the kids. He's the one constantly questioning if he's doing something right or wrong. Yeah. It exists on both parents. Well, I think this is the the key point with the guilt part for, for parents. Mm-hmm. Basically, it, there's guilt from like from doing something. Like you feel guilt for doing something wrong, right? Mm-hmm. But I think more of the guilt comes from like what you failed to do, like what you didn't do. Mm-hmm. Like, that's where I get the guilt. Like what I'm not doing is what I feel guilty about. Mm-hmm. I don't feel guilty about something I did wrong. You know, it's like almost the not doing of something. Yeah. And I shared that on a prior podcast with you is even when when we mess up, we have made a conscious effort to tell the kids like, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I misunderstood or yeah. whatever it was. And we're able to just kind of be vulnerable. And I think that's really important. Yes. So yeah, it's not what I did do. Even if I have to apologize that something went wrong, it's the piece that I'm afraid I'm not doing. Totally. I mean, I would say that's 95% of the guilt that I feel as a parent is like what I'm not doing. Mm-hmm. But then that's a problem too, because then you overcompensate, right? Mm-hmm. So then going back to this beach trip I was just on, I mean, we ate, it was for us, it was like a record. We went like five days straight in this beach house without going out to eat once. Wow. Like, so we brought all of our food. 
we just prepared everything. So we'd cook breakfast for them. And then we'd make sandwiches for lunch. Then yeah. I'd barbecue for dinner. And we did this for five days straight. And especially for a vacation, that's impressive. Because usually vacations, right. like, you live it up. Yeah. Well, to us, like, it's eating is like, I like to eat clean. So I don't like eating out a lot. It's just, I don't yeah. know. I feel like real crappy after I eat out. Yeah. It's a lot of extra oils. and Yeah. And for like five of us, it's like, you know, it's, it's over a hundred bucks to go out to any kind of meal with five people. Yeah. So yeah. we did that for five days straight, but you really, it's like an assembly line. It's literally like, all right, breakfast. All right. Two dozen eggs. And like, you know, the whole assembly line starts, then you have to clean everything up. And then like, you got to start yeah, lunch. It's a big production. And so after five days, I was like, you gotta be, I feel like I'm working. This is a vacation, <laughs> but like I've prepared every meal. I've cleaned up after every meal. Yeah. We don't let them do anything. Well, they should be like washing the dishes, but like yeah. clean them right. Well, because it's frustrating because they will take too long or they won't do it right or they'll miss a spot or whatever. And so you just don't right. have the patience for it. <laughs> so you're like, move. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like you, we, we're, we're trying to do so much for them and it's not helping them. Mm -hmm. That's not helping them. Mm -mm. Like we should just left them to their own devices. We should be like, listen, there's food in the refrigerator. Mm. If you're hungry, figure out what you want to eat and get it. Yeah. We'll cook one meal a day. That's what my parents used to do, dinner. Yes. They never did breakfast or lunch. It was just, they make dinner. The rest of the day, you're, everybody fends for themselves. Right. But for whatever reason, we're in this like routine of like, do you want eggs for breakfast or do you want pancakes? Oh, do you want butter and syrup on your pancake? Uh, you know, and you're like, just coddle, 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 coddle. And I'm like, yes, I'm doing it. I'm guilty of it. And I agree. We do the same thing and we catch ourselves. We're like, I think they should have cereal today. <laughs> like we try to like pull back <laughs> once in a while. Right. But yeah. And as a parent, by doing that and by making them three square meals a day and yes, it is a bit of an act of service, but it's also like you feel or you think that you're making your kid's life wonderful. Right. And that's what we all want for our kids. We want them to have a wonderful life. Healthy meals and wonderful yeah. lives, right? Yeah. Strong bones and healthy skin. Yeah. Yeah. And you want all that. But then there's a, a moment of realization where you're like, oh, crap, am I doing too much for them? <laughs> yeah. Are they going to think that they need a chef when they grow up because they got eggs and pancakes for breakfast every day? Yeah. But yeah, we do the same thing. It's so funny. And that now you're making me think because the girl that we took with us, who was both of our daughter's friend from our old neighborhood, mm -hmm. we call her the outdoor cat. Okay. Because like our parents are like the parents from the 70s. Like they're like, just go. Awesome. Yeah. And so very polite, very respectful, street smart. Like, so she'll jump on a bike and just go ride the neighborhoods. We were on Hilton Head Island. She'd never been there before. Yeah. Jumped, jumped on her bike and just went. She was out of there. Like, All right. See you later. Yeah. And then like cleans up after herself, gets her own food, doesn't complain much. Super self-sufficient. Yeah. And I'm like, nice. oh, wow. And in some ways, like, you know, we think like, it's kind of neglectful. And I'm like, how is it neglectful? Look at the kid. She's like super independent, you know? And she's, yeah. so it's, it's so hard. It's interesting. Yeah. And that's where it's like, are you judging? Are you the one being judged? Like there's just this constant push and pull. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to say like a dichotomy between what you think you're doing versus the results that you're getting. Yeah, the opposite. It's, it goes back to those opposites, like where yeah. you're doing one yeah. thing, expecting one result, and you're getting the polar opposite result. Mm -hmm. And you don't mean to, and you have the best intentions, right? Right, right. You just want to like put some healthy food on the table and for the kids to eat it and say thank you. <laughs> yeah. You know, but we've been trying at least to have them – learn how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, just for example. I mean, I've mentioned my kids are young, so that's quite a challenge. The jar for the jelly is glass, and so I'm worried about that. <laughs> and, you know, I'm handing a five-year-old a butter knife, and I'm thinking, oh, dear God, like... Don't put this in your eye, right? Yes, and so yeah. there's just all this, like, ridiculous fear. It's just a freaking peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Mm -hmm. But... It's like such a big deal for them to learn to make that themselves at such a young age because that's where we want them to be self-sufficient to a certain extent. Yes. We've put their cups down low. We've showed them, look, you get a cup, 
You push the thing on the refrigerator. You can get a drink whenever you want. You don't have to come ask me. Mm-hmm. You know, here's the cereal. Here's a certain amount of limited snacks that are down here. There's fruit. You can grab a piece of fruit anytime you want. You don't have to ask. Right. You can have fruit 14 <laughs> times a day. Yeah. Here. That's great. So there's like little things that we're trying. We're, we're really trying, but... Then like, there's the piece where you mentioned about like just jumping on your bike and going, Mm -hmm. Ooh, like that's hard for me still. Yeah. Like at least you're conscious of it. Like I think people just blindly are just, you know, helicoptering and thinking that they're helping. At least you're aware that like, all right, I'm helping, but like, I could also see the, how this could work in reverse. We're trying. I mean, we've told, especially our son, he's a little older and we've said like, we want you to be self-sufficient when you go to college or, you know, move out. I want you to know how to do laundry. I want you to know how to rinse the dishes and put it in the dishwasher and start the dishwasher. And so he'll do all of that, of course, with us guiding him Yeah. when we ask him to. Then at the same time in other areas, I am positive that I am just over the top way too much. And I'm trying to pull back. I'm trying to find that balance, but I definitely feel... Yeah. The guilt, the push and pull between am I facing the computer too much? Am I yeah. worrying about them too much? Do they have too much screen time? Screen time. Especially now with online school. Yes. Online school is like killing me because we used to really limit screen time like to 30 minutes or an hour a day. Like we were really strict about it. Right. And we do know of other little friends, same ages that there are no limits and they just play video games all day. And we can see Mm -hmm. how their lifestyle is building based on how much they're sitting in front of a screen. Yeah. And that's not us at all. Yeah. Yeah. Like for that, we felt like we were doing the right thing, but then now for school screen time is just blown. It's all the time. I mean, the whole day they're on the screen, they have to be for school. So it's, yeah. we used to have that seven hour or eight hour period during the day where they're in a classroom, they're with friends, they're with teachers, they're interacting. Human interaction. Yeah. And how is that going to affect them term, you know? But you know what? I was also thinking about this other thing. So we're talking about the guilt of parenting, right? Yes. Parent guilt. But there's a lot of other guilt that are happening at the same time that might be contributing Mm -hmm. even more so to the parent guilt. So like the guilt of like people being sick and being unemployed at this point, Mm -hmm. like, you know, because we're going through this crisis, Mm -hmm. it's not, I don't feel like I think about that a lot, but I think it's, there's a layer of that underneath everything. When I see somebody that's like sick or lost a family member Mm -hmm. to like the virus and, or somebody like they lost their restaurant they had for 20 years. And I'm like, I'm sitting here at home I'm working, everything, nothing really changed for me. Right. And like, I shouldn't be complaining, you know, because there, there's bigger problems than imagine you're broke and you have kids and are you right. really worried about their screen time at that point or? Right. You're probably hoping they watch TV before it gets repossessed right, or something. Because, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It could be like so many different problems. Right. Or like just feeling guilty for like being irritable towards your children because like you're in such close quarters. Yes. With them all the time. Yes. Or like you're feeling guilty for struggling with their the apps they have on their computer for school. So I can't figure this shit out. You know, I have no clue what the hell I'm doing. And I'm like, you know, and then like half the time the system doesn't work. It's, you know, so even if I'm getting it right, it's not loading or. Yeah, it's the internet connection. It's not even you. Yeah. So like there's all these layers, you know, so you're like, you're not, it's not just the screen time or just, you know, not doing the things we think we should. It's just Mm -hmm. many different things that are all kind of contributing. You can have guilt over, like you mentioned, the apps and the links and all this stuff not working. I'm kind of questioning. I mean, we've been in school now for five full days. Yep. Today was pretty great. I felt like they were getting in the stride of things. I mean, they're little, so I still have to check the time and be like, okay, when's your next meeting? And I'm kind of yeah on top of them. But I have printed out their schedule. So they have like a piece of paper with what time their stuff is because I want them to be self-sufficient yeah. in a week or two. You know, I'm I'm really trying. And then there's that piece of me when I can hear them struggling because they're right across the hall from me and some link isn't working or whatever. I'm like, 
should I just sit here and like count to 10 and like let them struggle for just 10 seconds? And like, that's so hard for me to do though. It's yeah. ridiculous. Right. You never want to, because you think that them struggling is them suffering. Right. Oh yeah. But at the, But at the same point, it's them learning something that they can't learn by you doing it for them. Right. Yes. I know that's always going to be the, you know, you don't want to see your kids struggle. I think yeah. at least my parents were so oblivious to like that kind of thing. I became very independent, like very young because mm-hmm. they were just kind of like, just go, just figure it out. You know, yeah. they didn't have this kind of, I don't think they did at least that they didn't have this worry of like, you know, we got to prepare things for our children we got to make sure they're doing that. Like I, w- I was left to my own devices to do my homework. Right. All they want to know is what my report card said at the end of the semester. Mm. Why did you get Why did you get a C? Right. You know, you should do better, you know? <laughs> and then like, well, maybe you shouldn't be doing like homework in front of the TV. They'd say something like that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but it was just such a different dynamic. Yeah. It really makes me think that the more independent you can get your children, the more like you could just leave them yeah. to struggle. Well, and I... I think we were just thinking about it too much. Absolutely. And I think that you had mentioned this to me prior was kids these days are so quick to say, I'm bored. I'm bored. It's basically like, yeah. hey, dad, will you entertain me? Or hey, mom, will you entertain me? And it's just like, yeah. if I said I was bored when I was a kid, I was handed a broom. <laughs> like, get to work, you know, help me sweep the floor. Help me. You want to do some laundry? Right. We did not say we were bored. If we felt like we were bored, we got our butts outside. Yeah. And we certainly didn't, if we did say it, we'd say it to friends. We wouldn't say it to our parents. Yes. And our my kids say it like, right, oh, we're bored. I'm like, yes. we're in a beach house. You have a pool. <laughs> it's beautiful out. We go to the beach every day. They, they got sick of going to the beach. Like what kid gets sick of going to like the best playground in the world, the beach? Yeah. After three days, they're like, we don't want to go anymore. We don't want to swim in the ocean. I'm like, you got to be freaking kidding me. <laughs> you're like, ah. We got four more days at the beach and you're going. So I think as adults, though, we have that broader perspective to know that when you're at the beach, yeah. you live it up because yeah. you're not there every day and right. it's a special occasion. And we're very aware of that difference between normal life and vacation time. And to the kids, they're like, I don't know, my dad brought me. Like, Mm -hmm. I'm bored. Yeah, because to a kid, your whole life is awesome, (laughs) right? But for an adult, we have to like do responsible adulting things that we don't like. Right. Think about it. I mean, at least I'll speak for myself. (laughs) I feel like a lot of my days are doing kind of like mundane tasks Mm -hmm. that I'd rather not be doing. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to be like paying bills and... You know, just working and like the stuff that you have to do, paying taxes and yeah, I don't know, the, the little things that everybody has to do, right? Right. Just to keep your life going. Right. Kids don't have to do any of that stuff. Their whole life is awesome, right? Right. So like when we go to the beach, we're like, this is freaking amazing. We got the whole day, got my cooler, <laughs> going in the ocean, like, you know, I got a boogie board. Yeah, it's true time off. Yeah. Their whole life's a vacation for the most part. Yes. For the most part. I mean, obviously they have school. Right. And- but even that, to them, that's why this whole pandemic has been actually a little bit hard on kids is because to them, school is fun. And they yeah. might not admit that, but that's where your friends are. That's you where your friends are. You get to go see your friends every single freaking day. Yep. And, you know, as a kid, when you go and you see someone every day, that's why that person is your friend. Mm -hmm. If you move or whatever, those kids aren't your friends anymore because you never see them. Right. And so that is their connection to people, to humans. Right. But for us, you know, it's all online or yeah, especially now. But yeah, not going to school has been an issue because Actually, school is kind of fun because they get to socialize. Yeah. The one thing I learned about the boredom thing, just to go back to boredom, Mm -hmm. is that it's not a personal thing to me and just give them a minute. You know, let them say they're bored. Just walk away. Yes. Two minutes later, they'll be playing. And it's like I get caught up in their worlds. Mm -hmm. And then I I catch myself and I'm like, you just got caught up in a 12-year-old's world. Right. Why are you getting upset that they're telling you that they're bored? Yeah. Part of it's because I'm trying to, like you were saying earlier, you're trying to create this great life for them and you want them to be like, have a happy life. Mm -hmm. 
but you can't control that. It's like they're, they're a kid. They're going to be bored sometimes. And then five minutes later, they're going to be running around playing. Yeah. And I, I catch myself doing that. And I got to like remind myself, give them a minute. Yes. Let them be crabby. They'll be crabby, but like they'll step right out of it. That's the best thing about kids is that like they don't hold on to anything for long. And it's like <laughs> sometimes it's almost like a test. Like if I say I'm bored and my parents don't react in any way, then I'll figure it out. I'll go do something. But if I say I'm bored yeah. and my parents react and they like turn on a TV for me yeah. or hand me a phone, they just solve my problems. Yeah. Well, it's like what you just said. Like when you have like, you put the cups lower so they can get a drink of water when they want, mm-hmm. when they want. They don't have to come ask you to get water. Yes. You want a piece of fruit, get a piece of fruit and eat it. So you don't need to ask me. You're doing all these like little things to make them and you do the same thing with boredom. Oh, you're bored? Mm-hmm. Go figure it out. Yeah. There's books over there. There's yeah. a game over there. Call a friend. I don't know. Do whatever you want to do. Right. Don't come to me with that. Well, and and this <laughs> applies in so many areas of life when someone reacts. And in this case, it's kids. And they say, oh, I'm bored. We have to realize that that's not a reflection of us. Right. That's a reflection of the way that they feel at that moment, what they're going through. That's not to say that we're doing anything wrong. Right. It's not a reflection of us. And that that applies in so many other areas of life. You know, a grumpy coworker or a crazy person on the freeway or a rude cashier or something like that. Yeah. Their reaction is not a reflection of anything that we did. We don't know what's going on. Right. Same thing. Yeah, nothing's personal. We shouldn't take it personally. Yeah. It's just a good reminder for parents. Like, don't, don't, take, don't take it personally. Yeah, don't take what your kid's saying personally. Because, like, yes. they'll say something different a minute later mm-hmm. and be in a completely different mindset a minute later. That's just who they are. That's what they do. Right. It's the beauty of kids. It's like they can just kind of jump around. They don't hold on to, like anger or guilt or all they don't hold on to any of that stuff they're just moving through the moments and that's again where like discipline wise you have to discipline like right when something happens because 10 minutes from now if you try to bring it back up they don't remember what they won't what the situation was or what they did or why right it's like a dog yeah it's like exactly <laughs> it's oh like my training God. a dog <laughs> if you don't catch the dog when they pee right away then it's like yeah. I'm not gonna rem- you can't like slap them on the butt like, you know, yeah. 10 minutes after they peed on the floor. Right. You know? They won't know why you're snacking them. Yeah. Yeah. When the ki- This sounds bad, but it goes right with that is when the kids were little, little, like two and under, my husband used to say, it's just like having a puppy. You feed them, mm-hmm. you take care of them, you make sure that they right. put their finger in the socket and you're good. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Just keep them alive until like they're old enough to. <laughs> yeah. He was like, it's just like a puppy. My dogs listen. You know, you say sit, they sit. The kiddo listens. This is great. <laughs> right. Very simple. Yeah. See, there's the man, man mind, right? Yes. <laughs> simple man minds. <laughs> just like a puppy. Like every mom out there is like. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I used to tell him, don't ever repeat that out in public. Don't ever yeah. tell someone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I treat my kids like puppies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So mommy parent guilt. Yeah. Mommy daddy parent guilt. Yeah. Parenting guilt overall. I think everybody feels it. Yeah. And especially now. I mean, everybody's home together. So Mm -hmm. everybody's kind of a little bit on edge at times, maybe more than at times. But (laughs) it's just we're all together. I mean, we're used to being apart for seven or eight hours a day. Yeah. You don't get away. I mean, it's, it's like you guys mentioned in a prior episode if there was any tension whatsoever, now you're stuck inside at home. Yes. Like it's going to be amplified or it's going to get better. Like, I don't know. It's yeah. just, we're all stuck here. So yeah, you don't have that time to kind of decompress. It's always, yeah. Mm-hmm. Please follow us at faconfessions.com and you can like and subscribe and share and maybe write us a review. Mm-hmm. So next week, what are we talking about, Virginia? Let's talk about forgiveness. I, I like that yeah, one. Yeah, we were going to do forgiveness today and we decided to, the parent guilt seemed very uh, timely. So, yes. But forgiveness, yeah, that's a good one. And we both have some personal stories to talk about, mm-hmm. which I'm sure will resonate with listeners. I'm, everybody's got it. I mean, everybody has to forgive people that they don't want to forgive or yeah. are trying to think of 
like the one thing that stuck out for when we first talked about this topic was knowing if you actually did forgive. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes you think you forgave somebody mm-hmm. and you didn't, or you did forgive somebody, but like since you're not in touch with them, you feel guilty about not being in touch with them. So they're like, right. maybe I didn't really forgive them. Or like, can you have possibly forgiven someone, but still not want them to be in your life? Right. Like, is that possible? Or like, did you really forgive them? And would you allow them in your life if you had? Right. Because I think we mix up, like, if you actually forgive them, then they should be in your life. And that's not true. Mm -mm. Right? You You can can still still forgive somebody and say, all right, that's enough. I I don't want you in my life. I do forgive you. I have no hard feelings or, you know. I ain't mad at you. (laughs) Yeah, I ain't mad at you. I just don't want to see you. Right. (laughs) Or talk or anything. Right. So that should be a good one. That'll be 41 next week. Episode 41. All right. So next week is forgiveness. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And thanks, Virginia. Thank you. All right. We'll see you next week. See you next week.